This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello, everyone. When Jesus left the Jordan River, having been baptized, he only did the will of his Father. He says himself he did not seek to do his own will. He only did the will of the Father. And this resulted in trouble for him. And when we read through the Gospels, we see the trouble escalating and escalating until finally the Jewish leadership conspired to have him put to death. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Didn't Jesus come to bring peace? The worldly church system routinely lists this verse among the hard sayings of Jesus because they have great difficulty comprehending how he could be saying these words. But it really isn't very difficult if we actually listen to Jesus and learn from him. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Is Jesus saying that he came to pick a fight? Let's read a little further. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Is Jesus saying he wants to cause strife among family members and break up families? Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What does he mean by a sword? Well, it turns out we have a parallel account in Luke. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no but rather division. The sword is a metaphor for division. That's what a sword does. It splits things into two. In that account in Luke, he says pretty much the same thing he does in Matthew. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Pretty much the same thing he says in Matthew 10. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Are you listening to Jesus? And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his soul will lose it, and he who has lost his soul for my sake will find it. He who loves father or mother more than me, he who loves son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me, is not worthy of me. Do you hear him? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own soul, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he teaches, so count the cost. This was an ancient Jewish way of contrasting preference of choice. You hate one option as compared to the other. To love one choice more than the other, or to hate one choice more than the other. And in Matthew 10, Jesus is saying the same thing. If you love father or mother, more than me. You must follow the Lord on his terms, not yours. No compromises to please your family members. Eventually, there will be a conflict of wills between serving the Lord and serving your family members. The Lord will want one thing, but your family members, another. The Lord will say, turn to the right, and your family will say, no, turn to the left. Which will you choose? And Jesus makes it crystal clear that if you seek to please your family and do their will, you cannot be his disciple. And Jesus said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So you see what both of these characters were doing here? They wanted to put their family members as a priority over following Jesus. And Jesus said, no way. Nothing can be a priority over following me and the kingdom of God. You must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not something you fit into your schedule. It's top priority all the time. And that's why Jesus said this. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You can't. Jesus doesn't mince words about any of this. The will of God and the kingdom of God and his righteousness must come first all the time. It's not you sacrificing a little bit of your time by your own will and decisions. It's submitting to the will of God anytime, all the time. He who loves father or daughter 
more than me. Your worldly family members are not going to be happy when you choose to serve the Lord as your top priority without compromise rather than them. Your family members will not be pleased and it will cause strife and division between you and them. He is the Lord, not you. The Lord decides what you will do, how you will do it, and when you will do it, not you, nor your family. Or will you instruct the Lord that your family members are your top priority at the moment and he'll just have to wait? If that is the case, Jesus tells us to forget it. You cannot be his disciple. And he came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his mind. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does the will of God, not your will, not your family's will, the will of God. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in the synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the nations. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The disciples of Jesus seek to have peace with men, peace in this world. They don't try to stir up trouble. But Jesus does not make peace by compromising the will of God. And neither do those who follow him. The point Jesus is making is that you must choose which side you're on. Are you on the world's side, or are, are you on his side? Because the will of the world is contrary to the will of God. Jesus came so that we might have peace with God. We can only have peace with God if we are reconciled to God through the death of his Son. And those of Christ no longer belong to the world who are at enmity with God. But the people of the world do not have peace with God. They are enemies of God and in rebellion to God. They are children of wrath, the sons of disobedience, those who walk according to the flesh. And the flesh is hostile to God. If you are a child of God who is led by the Spirit of God, the world will hate you and be hostile toward you and what you do because you will be doing the will of God rather than the will of man, the will of the world. And so those even of your own family will grow to hate you. 
if they cannot entice you to do their will and compromise rather than the will of God. And for that reason, if you remain steadfast in doing the will of God rather than their will, there will be enmity and division as sharp as a sword, as sharp as the distinction between the flesh of sin and its desires and the Holy Spirit of God and his desire. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. He who loves father or mother more than me. You must choose, so count the cost. If you love anything more than carrying your own cross and following Jesus and doing the will of God, then that's what you will serve instead of Jesus. And you cannot be his disciple. Count the cost. Do you want what God gives to those who serve him? Or what the world gives to those who serve it? The overwhelming majority, both in the secular world and the worldly church system, choose the latter and deceive themselves into believing they can be friends of the world and friends of God. Two, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God or enmity toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those in the worldly church system think they can play both sides of the fence, but you cannot. And Jesus made that crystal clear. Worldly churchianity supposes they can go about their business pretty much in the same way the rest of the world does, except they'll set aside a bit of time to read their Bible as it suits their own schedule and their own priorities, interpret the Bible according to their own liking, and then it is all up to them to decide what they will do, how they will do it, and when they will do it. Not only so, in much of Christianity, this is the only option, since after all, the only important thing to them is their own salvation. And whatever works they do are irrelevant to their salvation. It's all about their salvation ticket. You see, in the worldly church system, it's all about me. Me and my salvation and what I can get from God for me, myself. So they make themselves the Lord of their own lives and they might be such good people that they will sacrifice a bit of their time and do the Lord a favor once in a while, a favor especially designed by they themselves. Go away from me. I never knew you. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me not worthy of me. Are you listening to Jesus? Perhaps you have a whole family of genuine believers and you won't have this problem. But that's highly unlikely. 
A time will come when you cannot please both your family and God. You will come to a fork in the road, and you must choose what you will do. You can't take both. On that occasion, we must choose the will of God, or we cannot be a disciple of Jesus. He said so. And that's when the sword of division will strike. And choosing to serve the Lord will become a sword of division between you and your worldly family members. Because this isn't about you choosing what you want to do and when you will do it and how you will do it. The will of God is what he wants to do when he wants it done. So will you serve him or yourself? Because men who want to please their families over God are doing so to serve themselves rather than God. And Jesus said, if you're going to do that, you cannot be my disciple. Yes, we should love our families just as we are to also love our enemies. But that does not mean we do what they want us to do, does it? Jesus did not love anyone by compromising his Father's will. The will of God is doing what he wants us to do as our top priority all the time. He is the decider of our lives for the rest of our lives, and not us. It's not by our design, but his. That's how Jesus did it. And to follow him means to walk in his footsteps, walking just as he walked. No compromise. Following Jesus does not result in harmony between the world and genuine believers, but division. And it happens because they, the world, are enemies of God. And believers seek rather to have harmony with God, peace with God, rather than the world. This peace between the believer and God will result in division between us and the world, and the world isn't going to like it. That's why believers are persecuted. This is where persecution against followers of Jesus begins. When we do not do the will of those in the world, and choose rather to do the will of God, they don't like it when you do that. And this is how the enmity between Jesus and the Pharisees began. It's not any different for the followers of Jesus. Jesus taught us these things in many and various ways. But as usual, the people in the worldly church system do not want to hear him. And they do so because they still love the world and they still belong to it rather than Christ. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yes, the worldly church system finds this to be a hard saying of Jesus. And they find it so, because they do not listen to Jesus, nor do they even want to hear him. Jesus teaches that you must be all in or nothing, and they just don't want to hear about it. Do you wish to be God's enemy? 
or do you wish to be the world's enemy? It's one or the other. Choose which side you will be on. Peace with the world or peace with God. Because those who choose to do the will of the world over the will of God are not worthy of Jesus Christ. And he said so. And the free gift of eternal life is found in him. So it would be wise to listen to him and do what he says. Yahweh is one. Yahushua, the Christ, is his only begotten human son. Contrary to popular belief, Scripture does not teach that Christ is the Creator, that the Father and the Son are the same being, or that Yahushua existed prior to his birth in Bethlehem. Sadly, many beautiful and beloved brothers and sisters in the faith today have been deceived by tradition, and have allowed the erroneous doctrine of a pre-incarnate Christ to cloud their understanding of Scripture. In this video, we will ask some very important questions pertaining to this teaching. Questions that Trinitarians and Binitarians simply cannot answer without contradicting Scripture. It is our hope that, as you prayerfully contemplate these questions, you will lay aside all assumptions, preconceived ideas and cherished traditions. It is our humble admonition that you will allow the Bible alone to shape your understanding and frame your conclusions. Let's begin. Question 1. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how can the Father be beyond temptation while the Son is not? Scripture says plainly that Yahweh cannot be tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by Yahweh, for Yahweh cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Scripture is equally clear that Yahushua was tempted and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Therefore in all things he, Yahushua, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to Yahweh, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Question 2. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how can the Father know the timing of Yahushua's return while Yahushua himself does not? Isn't it nonsensical to suggest that the Father is keeping secrets from himself? But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Question 3. Yahweh is immortal and cannot die. Yahushua, however, died. He willingly laid down his life for you and me. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how is this possible? Yahweh is immortal. I urge you in the sight of Yahweh who gives life to all things, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Yahushua, however, died. And Yahushua cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. But Yahweh demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. To suggest that the Father and Son are in actuality one being makes a mockery of the crucifixion and reduces it to a charade. Clinging to the ideology that Yahushua is Yahweh demands that you also believe Yahushua only feigned death because he was still alive in heaven. Please pause for a moment to think about the ramifications of such a doctrine. This is irrefutably a denial of the gospel message. Question 4. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua say that Yahweh created mankind? 
Why did he not say that he created mankind? And Yahushua answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, Yahweh made them male and female. This was a remarkable opportunity for Yahushua to let everyone know that he was the creator if he wished to do so. He doesn't, though. He never made such a claim. Question 5. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua continually refer to his Father as a separate being? Now if Yahuwah so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And shall Yahuwah not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Question 6. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to Yahuwah as his God? Does Yahuwah have a God? And about the ninth hour, Yahushua cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yahushua said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. It is critical to note that Yahushua not only refers to Yahuwah as his God, but emphasizes that Yahuwah is the only true God, separate and distinct from himself. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yahushua the Christ, whom you have sent. Question 7. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua pray to the Father? Is he praying to himself? At that time Yahushua answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and have revealed them to babes. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Question 8. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Scripture distinctly say that it is Yahushua that will judge humanity and not the Father? How can the same entity both judge and not judge at the same time? For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Truly, these times of ignorance Yahuwah overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Question 9. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to Yahuwah as his Father? Is Yahushua his own Father? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me. But Yahushua answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Question 10. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to himself as the son of Yahuwah? Is Yahuwah his own son? For Yahuwah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Yahuwah did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Yahuwah. Simon Peter answered and said, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yahushua answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Did you get that? Peter declared Yahushua to be the Son of the living God. He did not say that Yahushua is the living God. The question naturally arises then, how and when did Yahushua become the Son of Yahweh? Scripture answers this question in plain language. Listen to Gabriel's explanation to Mary. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of Yahweh. Yahushua became the Son of Yahweh when he was conceived in Mary's womb through the overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit. Yahweh's immutable word, conceived in the virgin's womb, literally became flesh. It was this miraculous event that the psalmist prophesied about almost 1,000 years earlier. Yahushua, the promised Messiah, the descendant of David and heir to the throne, was to be literally begotten at a finite point in time. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Scripture does not teach that Yahushua pre-existed in heaven before condescending to become a human fetus. This is a human invention which cannot be substantiated by the Bible. Many, in recognizing that Scripture makes a clear distinction between the Father and the Son, admit they are separate beings but still cling to the idea that Yahushua is the co-creator and pre-existed in heaven prior to his birth in Bethlehem. Such a notion, though, presents us with a clear contradiction. Yahweh is one, and he alone is the creator and the only true God. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Thus says Yahweh your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am Yahweh, who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. The denial of this plainly stated truth is largely responsible for the rejection of the gospel by both Jews and Muslims. Yahweh is one. He alone is God. He alone is the Creator. The erroneous doctrine of Trinitarians and Binitarians immediately repulses sincere Jews and Muslims because both know that God is one. Consequently, their ears are closed to the life-giving truth as it is in Yahushua, and they are unable to comprehend the glorious gospel of Yahweh's grace and mercy. To be fair, there are many verses that on the surface appear to support the teaching of a pre-incarnate Christ. We must bear in mind, though, that the Bible's translators were not unbiased in their work. They were fallible human beings like you and me, with preconceived notions and inherited traditions, and intentionally or not, their bias shows up in their translations. A prayerful investigation into these supposed proof texts makes clear the fallacy of the Trinitarian and Binitarian doctrines. Much more could be said, but it is our prayer that you, as an honest Bible student and sincere seeker of truth, will prayerfully investigate these things on your own. Time is short, friends. The blasting of the seven trumpets is imminent, and the end of this age is at hand. Yahushua, the man whom Yahweh has ordained to judge the world, will soon return in the clouds of glory to establish Yahweh's everlasting kingdom upon the earth. Don't be found worshipping at the altar of complacency and tradition when he returns. Tear down at once the unbiblical and idolatrous Trinitarian Binitarian doctrine and make your stand on the Bible alone. Choose today whom you will serve. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Yahushua. Praise Yahweh's matchless name now and forever. Amen. 
For more on this important subject, please visit worldslastchance.com, click on the Content Directory button at the top of the page, and refer to the Trinity Doctrinal Error. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Would you like to know the future? You can, and you don't need a crystal ball to learn it. Prophecy reveals the future. If you would like to know why we are, even now, living in the time of the end, if you are interested in learning why this Pope is the very last Pope we shall ever see, if you want to know what will be happening in the near future, visit our website at www.worldslastchance.com. We have articles and videos that establish from Scripture what you need to know to spiritually prepare for the closing crisis. Visit us today, www.worldslastchance.com. Welcome back. It's time for our daily mailbag where we read your messages sent to us from around the world. So what's our question for today, Ma? Now, come on, give us a good one. Well, let's see. Have a rummage. Okay. Um, we've got this one here. Hai Sung. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Hai Sung in Cheonggyu, South Korea. I think I said that right. Very important question, though, for you, Dave. I think everyone has asked themselves at one time or another. Now, she writes... Dear WLC, the last six months have been very difficult for my family and me. Between the death of parents, health issues and other problems, I feel overwhelmed with grief and loss. It has caused me to question why. I just can't get that out of my head. I believe Yahuwah is a God of love. But why, then, does he allow suffering? I know we get a lot of letters about this, but please respond because I am really hurting right now. Dave, that is a tough one. It really is. And I know I've asked that sometimes before too. I think we all have, Miles, actually. And it is a very, very good question and touches everybody at some time in life or other. First, though, let me just say how sorry I am, Hai Sung, for the pain that you're going through. Please accept my serious condolences for the loss of your loved ones. Yeah. When we walk through the valley of the shadow, it's not just frightening. It hurts. It hurts really badly. I'm glad that you wrote and asked, though, because, as Miles said, your question is a good one, and it's one that we can all relate to at some point in our lives. I know I can, Dave. I know. Absolutely, me too. There are a couple of points we can remember. First, Hebrews chapter 4 says... We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, we do have a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. What we feel, Yahushua feels. And because he and his father are one, what we feel, Yahuwah feels too. Your pain throbs the heart of Yah. And that's a new thought to me. It's very comforting. We all want to know we're not alone, that someone understands, that someone feels what we're feeling. And the Father does. So when you're hurting, when you're suffering, know that Yahweh is not holding himself aloof from it all. He feels the pain, physical, mental, psychological and emotional, that you feel too. And that brings me to my next point, because if Yah were selfish, he would of course step in and intervene, if for no other reason than to save himself the pain of feeling our sufferings. Mm. But he's not selfish, and that's why he doesn't step in. Just explain a little bit more. What, what do you mean by that? Well, do you know anyone who's mentally ill? Not, not naming names, just in your own mind. Do mm. you know, say, a narcissist or someone with borderline personality disorder? Yeah, well, yeah, I know a couple of people, actually, who fit that definition of the narcissist. Well, what's something that they hold in common? Um, 
well, they they project. Mm. Narcissists accuse others of of being what they are. Yeah, excellent example. Yes, and yeah. Satan does that too. The devil projects his own character attributes on Yar. Mm. One of the things he's accused Yar of doing is being arbitrary, of demanding self sacrifice from his followers, not exercising self sacrifice himself, yeah. of being controlling and not allowing for personal self determination. Can yeah. you see that? Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Satan gets people thinking that the father is cold, harsh and unforgiving, when in reality it's the devil who's that way. But but how does that apply to this question here? I, I, I don't see the connection. OK, well, it applies because, in a sense, Yah's hands are tied. He's a lover of freedom. Yahuwah will never force the human will. He will always allow for freedom of choice. In fact... Yahushua's death guarantees our right to choose. Yeah, but how is, I'm sorry to keep questioning, but how so? I mean, I mean his, his death redeems us, but how does it guarantee our individual right to choose? When Adam and Eve sinned, yeah, mm, they yeah. gave up the divine nature with which they had been created and they took on Satan's nature. That fallen nature they passed on to every single one of their descendants. Mm. That's why we say the fallen human race. We've inherited a fallen nature. Yeah, I'm with you so far. OK, so let's just ask then, what does Romans 6.23 say? The wages of sin is... Death, but the gift of Yah is eternal life through Yahushua. Because all of us have fallen natures, we have all sinned. Just yeah. a few chapters earlier in Romans, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Now, since the wages of sin is death, since everyone has sinned, no one has freedom of choice. We are all justly condemned to death. That's Satan's character being exemplified here. No freedom of choice, just force. But what does the last of Romans 6.23 say again? But the gift of Yah is... Eternal life through Yahushua. Right. You see, yeah. it's Yahushua's death that guarantees yeah. everyone freedom of choice. Because the human race has inherited a fallen nature, all were lost. No question. But the father said, uh, uh, that's not fair. These people did not choose to inherit Satan's nature. They were just born that way. I want to give them a second chance. And that's where Yahushua entered the picture. By sacrificing his only begotten son, Yahweh redeemed the fallen race. So that then turns us full circle to Hai Sung's question. Let me tell you a story to illustrate this. In September 2015, on a Sunday afternoon, Marco Muzo flew home to Ontario, Canada from his bachelor party in Miami, Florida. It's unknown how many drinks he had on the plane, but he had some, and even more the night before. After collecting his Jeep Cherokee from airport parking, he drove home, travelling in excess of the speed limit. On the way, he ran through a stop sign, colliding with another vehicle. The National Post reported he was so drunk he needed others to help maintain his balance and was unable to comprehend instructions from police officers. The horrific accident killed a grandfather and three young children, ages nine, five, and two. What a tragedy. I mean, I don't even like hearing such stories. You just can't help but put myself in the places of those parents, you know? And, and yeah, I, I'd be asking the question, why? Yeah, it is heartbreaking. But it gets back to the free exercise of the will. No one forced Marco Muzo to get behind the wheel of a vehicle while he was drunk. In fact, no one held a gun to his head and forced alcohol down his throat until he was so inebriated his judgment was impaired and he made a stupid decision that claimed four lives and changed the course of his own life. He made those choices and he is responsible for them. But others pay the price. How, how is that fair, Dave? Well, you're right, it's not. Mm. But by stepping back and allowing sin to run its course... The entire universe can observe the sinfulness of sin. This is why, when it's all over, sin will never rise a second time. All will have seen how truly horrible, evil, painful and, yes, unfair sin really is. And no one throughout the unlimited cycles of eternity will ever choose to violate the divine law. Mm. You see, when Satan seduced one-third of the angels to join him in his rebellion... No one had ever been lied to before. They didn't know what deceit was. They loved him. 
They trusted him. Why not? Purity and holiness was all they'd ever known. In order to reveal the truth without forcing the will, Yar had to step back and give it time to develop. So we're all just waiting for the demonstration to be over? Oh, oh no, no, that was finished at the cross. Now we're waiting for everyone to make a decision. Once that point is reached, it will all be over, and Yahushua will stand up and declare that it's over. Revelation 22.11 records it. So, could you please, in your lovely Bible there, flick for us through to uh, Revelation 22.11 and read it for us, please. Okay. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Does that mean that if someone hasn't made the choice, whoops, too bad, so sad, too late, sorry? No, this is what we refer to as the close of probation. It's simply a statement of fact that all have made their decision. It's all over and Yahushua can return for his waiting children. But in the meantime, yes, we live in a sinful world. Bad things happen to good people and often good things happen to bad people. It's mm. part of life in a sinful world. It's why Yahweh never wanted for sin to enter the equation. But now that it has, this demonstration of the sinfulness of sin will put the world on an eternal basis of security. No one will ever be deceived again. No one will ever be beguiled into breaking Yah's law. This all makes sense now, but emotionally... It's just really hard to accept when you're the one going through all these trials. Yeah, it is. It is, absolutely. We're about out of time, really, but are there any thoughts that you can share to inspire faith whilst walking through the Valley of the Shadow? Or perhaps any promises that we can cling to? Yeah, absolutely, I can, yes. In Joel 2, it's a very beautiful promise. It says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. Locust grasshoppers do a lot of damage. Get enough of them, they can strip a field bare, leaving nothing at all behind. Absolutely. Total devastation is yeah. their watchword, as it were. In years yeah. past, people would starve when plagues of locusts would come through and destroy the year's crops. Yeah. But the promise goes on. Could you read it for us in Joel there, starting in verse 26? Yeah, I've got it open for you here. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of Yahweh your Eloah, who has dealt wondrously with you. Now notice that. Even in the face of everything they lost, it will be restored in such a way that all will be satisfied and will agree that Yahweh dealt wondrously with them. So keep reading. One more verse. Okay. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am Yahweh, your Eloah, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. That's a promise with which it to is. cling. Yeah. He will restore what the locust has eaten. But there's more. Now, my personal favourite is in Revelation. So let's flip back to that one, towards the end of the okay. Bible there, uh, yeah. and chapter 21. So if you could read verse 4 of Revelation 21, please, Miles. Revelation 21, 4. It says... And Yah shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Oh, I love this verse. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. wonderful. It's, it's great. Sometimes the trials we go through cause pain so deep it feels like we can't even cry. Because if we started, well, we'd never stop. Mm. But this powerful promise assures us that regardless of what happens to us here, Yah will wipe away all tears. There will be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he's got the power to do that. Remember that, friends. No, no matter what happens in life, you can trust Yahweh to right every wrong, to restore what the enemy has taken and to wipe away all tears. If you've got any questions or comments, send them to us. Go to our website, worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. 
We enjoy hearing from our listeners, so please do not hesitate to get in touch. We want to hear from you. Paul told Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you will carefully read through the material on our website, you will have a thorough grounding in not only doctrinal truths, but you will also learn the secrets to effective prayer and how to study the Bible, so you can discover truth for yourself. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. It's never too late to get started. This is Elise O'Brien with your daily promise from Yah's Word. If there were a single desire cherished in the hearts of people the world over, it would be the heart longing for acceptance. Everyone everywhere longs to be loved and accepted for who they are on the inside, all masks laid aside. It is the fear of rejection that keeps our masks in place, that leads to shallow friendships and keeping others at arm's length. But that desire to be utterly known and utterly loved for who we are remains. And more than anything else, we want to be loved and accepted by our Heavenly Father. However, with our human limitations, fear creeps in. What if... What if he's like me? What if when he looks at me, he only sees the ugliness? What if he's critical? What if instead of loving me, he only judges me? This soul-deep longing mingled with fear was powerfully expressed in the words of a song written by Scott Stapp. Although written when he learned, to his surprise, that he was going to become a father, the sentiment of the lyrics perfectly expresses the heart-longing each person feels when faced with the thought of standing before the Almighty in all his perfection. Stapp wrote, If I had just one wish, only one demand, I hope he is not like me. I hope he understands. If Satan is tempting you to stay away from the Father until you've quit committing this sin or started doing that duty, don't listen to him. Satan knows that Yahweh will always accept everyone who goes to him. Yahushua said, He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And the Father adds his own assurances of acceptance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he urges you, I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith Yahweh Almighty. That's His promise to you. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ 
at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.